You know, it appears that uh, September's gonna be a busy month. We got two conferences to go to, filming for Skywatch TV, and, and uh, Mary and I have been talking, we should have done this when we were in our 30s. It would have been a little bit easier. <laughs> we're entering into a time that's just begun the last 24 hours of Teshuvah, of a time of repentance. And I want to deal today with the kingdom biblical patterns in Teshiva. And so I want to start in Romans chapter 4. And this actually connects to everything we're doing with understanding the kingdom because how many know God loved us enough to give us patterns? Because His kingdom moves in a certain pattern. The kingdom of darkness always moves in a certain pattern. Thank God because if you learn the patterns and how the kingdom flows, you can begin differentiating between the two. Now in Romans 15 and 4 it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That means all the Tanakh. Everything from Genesis to Malachi. That we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And so as we read through the Scriptures, and, and you know the, the quandary because it, we're, we're in this situation People will quote Paul when he said all Scripture is given by God. But when he wrote that, he was looking at the Tanakh, pointing and saying all those Scriptures were written by, given by God. And not, I don't think any of them had a clue that any of the epistles that they were writing or the Gospels they were writing were going to survive much past them. They never, I believe, had in their minds that it would one day their writings would be considered Scripture. And yet today what we have done is we have excluded everything the Apostle Paul and those of the saints in the first century church looked at as Scripture. We have dismissed all those things and simply looked to their writings as Scripture. In fact, there have been popular megachurch ministers on television that have said you do not need anything but the Gospels. You cannot understand the Gospel properly without the Tanakh. You're entering into a civilization and a culture that God had spent 2,000 years building, and now you think you can divorce from that and understand what they're talking about. That's one of the reasons why everything in the church today is really screwy. And that's just being polite about it. When we read it and we understand the patterns, we learn the stories, it, it, through patience, it brings us comfort of the Scriptures. Now, this is one of the things that I'm so grateful of the patterns of God and, and the Scripture because when I do abide in this, it gives me comfort. How many of us have faced Goliath in our time? Okay. He's big, he's ugly, and he's got bad breath. But you know all it takes is a young shepherd boy, a covenant with God, and a rock, and he's going down. It brings comfort. These patterns of the Tanakh give us comfort. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 through 11. You see, not only is it to give us hope, it also teaches us in all those stories of things not to do. How many know God did that because He loved us? God didn't need a publicist to whitewash and spin all the things that He said to make it acceptable to the public. He just said what it was, and His position is, you better learn from my examples to make yourself acceptable to me. A little bit different. Now these things were our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, they sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Let us not commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand." Neither let us tempt Christ, as some have also tempted, and were destroyed by, of serpents. 
Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, or examples, and they were written for our admonishment, whom, upon whom the ends of the world are come. These are more than just children's stories. The church today has divorced itself not only from the Old Testament, but, but, but frankly quite a bit of the New Testament. We're looking through lenses that we have made, rose-colored lenses. And we're ignoring the patterns, and because of that, we're falling into the enemy's patterns. We don't know where we are. If we don't understand those patterns, we miss the significance of where we are today in the body of Christ. Now, I thank God that God uses patterns because it's a part of the way of knowing Him and knowing what He's doing. I'm going to give you um, an example of this in the life of Jesus, and I want to go to Deuteronomy 18. We're going to be jumping around a little bit because you know, I've always taught everyone that the, when you look at the tabernacle, it's the universal template. It explains everything. It explains the Godhead. It explains our tripartite nature. It explains the three heavens. It explains how you live your, how you walk with God from the inside out, not from the outside in. That's what a religious spirit does. And a religious spirit never seems to make its way on the inside to purify anything. Okay. Deuteronomy 18, starting with verse 15. Now, this is God talking to Moses. And the Lord thy God shall raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him shall ye hearken, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, they have spoken, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth. Underline that in your Bible. And put my words in his mouth. Kind of like, just like he did Moses. What we call the writings of Moses, we call them those because a human wrote them down. But God said, get a pad. Get a, take, a, take a memo, would you, Moses? When I was up in Kansas City, I listened to Pastor Morford, who, who is an expert in the Hebrew and, and all the typology there and all the symbolism and everything else. And one of the things the rabbis taught was the second time that he went up, we always talk about just the ten words that were on the tablets. That's not what the rabbis teach. How many know with a laser you can put real fine print? And one of the things they taught was that God took his finger and on those two tablets was the entire Torah. And what's amazing about it is they say, you know, sometimes when the, in Hebrew when you'd make the loop, the, the hole there should have fallen out. You know, if you're cutting all the way through in stone, the, the, the pieces of the rock stayed in place so, so that you could really see what it was. And so I can imagine... Then, you know, the next 40 years, Moses looking with a magnifying glass, trying to write it right, what God did in laser there. And I, I think it's, it's, it's type and shadow of when we got saved, Jeremiah 31 says that the Holy Spirit wrote the Torah on, the, on our hearts. And it's more than just 10 words. It's all 613 commandments of the Torah. But he said, he said, now listen, I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I have commanded. Now we find in, in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 14, and this is where Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And uh, they answered, he said in, in verse 14, and they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So I broke it out and read it in Greek. Now sometimes when we're, when we're transliterating, your, your culture and your paradigm and, and your thought analysis plays a critical role in how you interpret that Greek or that Hebrew or Latin or whatever. 
when you look at the Greek, it literally says Elijah or Jeremiah or the one prophet. Not one, it can be translated one of the, but of the is not in the Greek. It's the one prophet. What one prophet? One just like Moses. You see, they were always looking for that one prophet that was Messiah. Well, why could they say that? John chapter 10, or John chapter 5. I want you to listen to these words of Jesus because they got mad at him when he said it thinking he was equating himself equal with God, and what he was doing was literally fulfilling what Moses had been promised. John chapter 5, 17 through 19, Then Jesus answered them, My father worketh hereunto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought to kill him the more, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, or their laws about the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father, making him equal with God. Then Jesus answered unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son of Man can do nothing of himself. But what he seeth the Father do, for what things do he, whatsoever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Now why was it they always got mad at Jesus for healing on the Sabbath? You know, they had six days and they couldn't get it done, but they got mad at him on the Sabbath because they understood when you bring all of the Tanakh together, it, the, the Sabbath is the Messiah's day. Jesus said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. It's a divine rehearsal of the millennial reign. When G, every time that Jesus healed on the Sabbath, he was proving that he was Messiah. That's really what they were getting mad about. Because it, you can't do, when, when you pray for somebody to be healed, it's never you doing the work. It's the Father doing the work. You're just expressing what the Father did. Then in John chapter 12, verses 49 through 50, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave with me a commandment that what I should say or what I should speak, and I know that his commandment is, is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father has said unto me, so I speak. In other words, he's putting his words in my mouth. Jesus was the prophet. The type and shadow is Moses. What was the first plague that Moses brought upon Egypt? He turned water into blood. What was the very first miracle that Jesus did? He turned the water into wine. In a Jewish mind, wine and blood are synonymous. It was saying, I am the prophet that's coming. How many know, how many know that, that pattern? Because there have been so many people that have claimed to be Messiah. But none of them have been like unto Moses except for Jesus. And yet in today's church, we are so stuck on misunderstanding. I'm trying to be nice this morning. That uh, we look at Moses and think that he is the antithesis to Jesus instead of the perfect type and shadow of Jesus. We think that Moses and Jesus are at odds. And the Moses and Jesus of the Bible both look at us and say, are you crazy? He came like me. And if Moses could testify today, said not only did he come like me, but he was the one on Mount Sinai giving me the commandments. So this pattern is there. It is quintessential for our understanding. Now the feasts, we look at the feast of the Lord. I mean, no, they're not the feast of the Jews. We've covered this here a lot. They are the feast. They're not even the feast of Israel. They're the feast of the Lord. Why did Israel get to participate? Because they were the only nation that was the Lord's. Okay. The spring feast, Jesus has 99.9% .9 fulfilled because I think when we, we come to the book of, of, of Tribulation or the book of Revelation again, the only way of salvation, the only way of safety is you better make sure that the blood's over the doorpost. 
Okay? Jesus is the Passover lamb. He is that lamb promised to Abraham when Abraham was going to offer Isaac and, and God stopped his hand. He said God would provide a lamb, but there was only a ram in the thicket. And from that day forth, we have the shofar, which comes from a what? What is this? Ram's horn. That every time you blow it, it is a cry for God to send his lamb. Fulfill what you promised to Abraham. And there was one walking on the shores of Galilee. And John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is that perfect Lamb. He died during Passover. In fact, you know, why, why, did, why did He say, It is finished, and I thirst? If, you, if, if we could go back in time, and we could be between the temple and the cross... There are several phrases we would be hearing in stereo. Because when the high priest had that one lamb that he went to Bethlehem to get and bring up was for the whole nation of Israel. When he got through uh, killing all the lambs that everybody brought for their Passover sacrifice and he got to that one lamb, he would stop and say, I thirst. It was a signal that this next lamb was for all of Israel. And so you can hear in stereo the high priest and Jesus on the cross saying, I thirst. When that lamb was slain and it was prepared properly, he would stop and say, it is finished. And it went in stereo. The very second that he began to utter, it is finished, Jesus said, it is finished, and released his spirit. There, there were a lot, if there was any Jews paying attention, it's like one of those moments where you go, whoa. The synchronicity of the kingdom. Jesus is the Passover lamb. He is that unleavened bread come down from heaven. If I had a piece of matzo bread today and I would show it to you, it's pierced and it's striped. His body was pierced and by his stripes we are healed. It was signified all the way back to the very first Passover what the Lamb of God would do for us. He's also the first fruits of the resurrection when he raised from the dead. Jesus fulfilled the spring feast. We are still currently at Shavuot, although we don't know what Shavuot's about, for the most part. Baptists look at it without a clue. Charismatics look at it about speaking in tongues. We don't know that there, were, there have been many, many Shavuot's before that Shavuot we find in the book of Acts, the very first one was when God came down on the mountain with fire. Freaked Moses out, freaked the children of Israel, and said, Whew, you, you just speak to Moses, just, just speak to him, that's cool. That same fire that set that mountain on fire descended with the Holy Spirit because Jesus came to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Why? To put the fire on the inside of us to live his commandments that he gave at the very first Shavuot. You see, it's only when a heart ablaze for God, living the commandments the way that Jesus said they could be lived, not only are we a testimony to the Gentiles, but we're a testimony to all of Israel that Jesus is the Messiah. And it's from that point of obedience, fire, and anointing that we evangelize the world with the gospel of the kingdom. Not the gospel of getting saved and sitting on your blessed assurance and, until Jesus comes back, but actually functioning and yielding to the kingdom of God because of what Jesus has done. So when we get to the fall feasts, the Feast of Trumpets or Yom Teruah, it's that last trump the Apostle Paul was talking about when that last trump comes. How many know there are seven trumpet blasts in the book of Revelation? 
When you get to that last one, the Bible draws a line in the sand and says, right here the wrath of God begins. The Bible says we have been not called to the wrath of God. It's that harpazo, that catching away of the church. I'm looking forward to that. Well, Brother Mike, when's it going to be? Well, it may be toward the end of the tribulation period, the way that I'm seeing it. And I tell people that if it's at the beginning of the tribulation period, I will give every pre-trib preacher a high five on the way up. I am not going to say, no, I'm not going until then. No. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm like Dr. Malt, uh, Mart, Malt, Martin Walter, or Walter Martin, there we go. I get it here just in a minute. Trying to think in Hebrew, everything's going backwards. Um, you pray for pre and you prepare for post. There's this wisdom in that. Because I would rather be surprised by rapture than surprised by tribulation. Bad news. Okay. But the day of trumpets is also the day that the books are open for judgment. That all the books are open. That, that heaven makes an announcement that the king is in the field, that all these things are going on. In fact, many scholars believe that when, that when Nebuchadnezzar, God warned him of judgment, I'm getting ready to judge you. And Daniel said, boy, you, you need to repent and to start doing some good works, man, because that's the Jewish way of repenting. You not only repent, but you do good works. Feast of trumpets. God gave him one year to the day to repent. He got to the next feast of trumpets. He's walking around saying, I've done this. I've done that. And God struck him with madness for seven years. So there's some things that I, I see two things because this is the time that God begins to speak things. He opens up books and he either says, you need to repent or prepare to get promoted. Can happen if you've really been trying to push into God and all the, this time of year, God can say, prepare for a promotion and then you can prepare an entire year for promotion that usually is launched in, in the feast the next year. Just want to throw that out there. The 10 days of awe is you got 10 days to get right with God because you don't want to end up at the day of atonement not right with God. Because any, anything that does not humble itself and bow before the king is cut off on the Day of Atonement. Which is divine rehearsal of Jesus coming back as Messiah ben David, the conquering king of the Valley of Armageddon, and the destroying of the armies of the son of perdition. Feast of Tabernacles, the millennial reign of Christ. Almighty God has come down and he tabernacles among us. And Jesus will rule and reign a seventh-day reality. He will have his thousand years, his day, of ruling and reigning on the earth. But sometimes what we forget is there is another part of this that just began in the last 24 hours. That before the Day of Atonement, and this was done in Jesus' day, it goes way back, that there are 40 days of repentance. This is the only time of the year that Israel traditionally ever had a national call to repentance every year. And it is 30 days before the Feast of Trumpets, and it includes the 10 days of all. And so it's, it's Teshuvah. And so the, for now for years... Israel has not really observed it. You know, God's made them a nation. They've not really observed it. The church is clueless. There are many of us that are beginning to wake up. But here in the last couple of years, the leading rabbis have begun calling this time of year for repentance, to prepare for the coming of Messiah. Now it's 40, now it's, it's 40 days, but it's divided in 30 and then 10. It's interrupted by the Feast of Trumpets. Now, 40 is the biblical number representing testing and trial. 40 years in the wilderness because of disobedience. 40 days Jesus fasted and was tempted. While Moses was fasting for 40 days, you know the first time that Moses went up and he got the, the Ten Commandments? He was fasting 40 days, but the trial 
The one being tested was Israel. And they flunked. All it took was 40 days. He comes back down. They've made the golden calf. And they're having this huge pagan ritual with all the things that go along with pagan rituals when he comes back down with the commandments. What's interesting is the, 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 the teshuva marks the day that Moses went back up the mountain the second time to get the tablets. And so this time, instead of making a golden calf, all of Israel was repenting before God for what they had done. You count 40 days, and so you have the law of God coming down the mountain to be established, written in stone, and Moses comes down on the Day of Atonement. Right there's where you stop and say, bam! <laughs> when, when you see how it all comes together. Now, This is a time of call repentance. Now, uh, Teshuvah shows us several things. Number one, the need to return to the spiritual discipline of repentance in the last days. Teshuvah is directly connected to the fall feasts. So it shows us that the remnant, that the elect are going to enter into a lifestyle of massive repentance to get ready for the days that are ahead of us. Forty represents trial before the Messiah's return. Therefore, repentance and seeking His face will be quintessential for survival. Not, I, I wish I could take the screen right now and bold and highlight this because we have people that are preaching the gospel without repentance. It's not the gospel. You can harp all you want about the love of God, but if it does not bring you to repentance, you're not moving in the love of God. It is a pseudo love that does not change your nature at all and goes along with this liberal spirit. Rosh Duny, and I've shared this before in his first volume on understanding the laws of God, he said that whenever evil wants to change a culture or there's a sweeping to change a culture it will try to push tolerance oh you just gotta love to establish a new intolerance and there are many of those today that are proclaiming the love of god you just gotta accept everything for love but they'll chop you off at the knees instantly if you don't agree with them you see they've not been touched by love 1 Corinthians 13 says that love is not easily offended, yet offense is the first thing they go for. You've not been touched by love. Come on now. We use the love of God as an excuse not to repent, and you'll end up in hell over it. Because God says, here's, my, here's love, this is how you show love for me. You repent, you get right with me, and you keep my commandments. So it's going to separate the sheep from the goats is repentance, not love. And once you've repented and you've received a new spirit, a new heart, that new man on the inside, you can now love with a love that passes all understanding. Now, here's the neat thing I got, I got out of this when I looked at this. For the believer, the 40 days, the Teshuvah shows that there will be this, this time of repentance and time of trial will be interrupted by the Feast of Trumpets, the harpazo of the church. You're going to connect this in a minute. That those days will be shortened for the elect's sake. Yep. Thank you. That those that have entered in get to 30. And 30 is the number of biblical maturity. 
When you, you could, even if you were a, a Kohanim, you could not enter into ministry as a priest or as a Kohen until the age 30. Jesus did not enter into ministry until the age 30. The Bible says, Let us rejoice and be glad, giving the glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife has made herself ready. That there's, there's this, there is this place in the book of Revelation that she goes from being bride to wife, matured. The repentance plus the trial brought maturity And when that maturity reached its crescendo, it causes the trumpet to blow and we're taken out of here and then God pours out His wrath for 10 days. Why 10? Well, we can start out and say, well, 10 is an interesting number because it's the exact same length of a Hebraic wedding feast. It's 10 days. You think some of us party when we get married, they did for 10 days. But biblically, the number 10, the 10 days of awe, represent testimony, law, responsibility, and completeness of order. That what Jesus does when he comes back as Messiah ben David is complete biblical order. That's why we see God's called out ones in the book of Revelation. As God is pouring out His wrath, we say, you're right, you're just, you're holy. Oh. Some of the same ones today just pushing the love of God, love of God, love of God, went on record saying, I can't serve a God that would do that. Then you're serving the wrong God. You have made your own idol. My soul was not saved by the hippie Jesus that said everything's this karma, everything's this cool. They forget the first time he did not come to judge, but baby, he's coming to judge the second time he comes. You rejected his love on his terms, and now you get the judgment. Guys, Teshuvah is an essential part of preparing for the Lord's return And it is also in stark contrast to this generation who believes they can enter into salvation and the kingdom without repentance. Or those that say, we're now beyond repentance. Are you in heaven? If you're not, you're not beyond repentance. All the feasts of God are cycles of sanctification. The, every time the kingdom comes in greater power, it is always preceded by repentance. Now, Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would loose on us a spirit of repentance. Holy Spirit, you've come to sanctify We open up every place in our being, spirit, soul, and body. We open up every part of our soul. We open up every room where the carnal nature can still try to flourish that we have refused to crucify. And Holy Spirit, we ask that that you would come in, that you would convict, that you would put your light of truth on it, and then you would give us the grace to repent and to crucify that, to bring us closer to your kingdom. And closer to our Savior, we ask. In Jesus' name. Are you hungry for the truth? Then come to Hear the Watchman Part 2, September 30th through October 2nd at the Knoxville Marriott in Knoxville, Tennessee. This is an advanced once-in-a-lifetime end times knowledge and prophecy event you don't want to miss. We are at the end of the age, and God is raising up His remnant people. You will witness the wisdom of Pastor Paul Begley, L.A. Marzulli, Anthony Patch, Dr. Michael Lake, Russ Didzar, John Reagan, Josh Tolley, Coach Dave Daubenmeyer, Michael Boldia, and John B. Wells. So sound the alarm. God has strategically placed this conference exactly at the 70th Jubilee. Learn to take authority over the enemy with cutting-edge material by these amazing men of God. This event will sell out, so book your room and tickets now. Go to hearthewatchman.com. That's hearthewatchman.com. And if God is tucking at your heart, be obedient. Come and hear the Watchman Knoxville and receive unprecedented knowledge and be transformed.